let you know or give you a little quick heads up. Um, you may notice the slides on the screen behind me are just a little different than normal, and you'll see that in the sermon as well. But be patient because this is some new technology that we've invested in, and it might take us a little bit to get it all straightened out. So hopefully, hopefully you won't notice anything, but if you do, just be patient. We'll work out the kinks as we go through it. Let's, um, let's pray together. Let's ask that God would bless his word to us this morning. Father, uh, we thank you that, um, in, especially in the Old Testament, as your people waited for you to come, you sustained them with your word. Um, you sent prophets and you sent messengers, um, sometimes comforting the people, sometimes correcting them, sometimes calling them to obedience as they waited the coming of Jesus. Uh, today, Lord, you're, you continue to provide for us through your word as we wait for Jesus to return. Um, and so we pray that we would receive it. We pray that it would nourish and strengthen us in our faith. Uh, we pray that it would help us know you better. And as we, um, as we read it and open it this morning, we ask that your Holy Spirit would be at work among us. Um, I would pray, too, for your blessing on me um, as I bring your word, that it might uh, come through with clarity and with conviction. Um, help me to do that in a way that pleases you. We ask it and pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I, uh, I don't know how many times this past week you've found yourself waiting uh, for something. And if you have, and probably you all have, at least for something, maybe you've paid attention to the emotions that go along with, with waiting. So, you know, if you're stuck in traffic and you're just kind of waiting, maybe you're waiting for a train or maybe you're waiting for an accident to clear up or something like that, and, and you, you sort of, it's the waiting of impatience, Right, especially if you're not naturally a patient person, you get stuck there, and you know you start checking your watch or you paying attention to the time, and, and you just want traffic to get moving so that you're not going to be late for your appointment, or so you can just go ahead and get home. And and sort of there's that irritability and impatience that that goes along with that kind of waiting. And then there's then there's other kinds of waiting. I mean, if you're um, if you're a, a senior in high school, it's it's almost time probably. Maybe you've already started to fill out applications for which college you're going to attend, and you know, you fill out all the paperwork and you fill out the financial aid forms and you do all that and then you send them off and then it, it's kind of like your life feels like it's in limbo because, you know, wherever you get accepted and wherever you get good financial aid packages, well, you don't know all of that and until you do, you don't know where you're going to be living, you don't know where you're going to maybe even study and, and so it kind of feels like life is on hold and there's some excitement built into that but there's also some uncertainty and, and maybe even some fear that goes along with that and, and, and you're just, you're kind of waiting with that anxious and uncertainty. And then there's, then there's another kind of, of waiting altogether. There's the waiting of, you know, if you go into the doctor and they run some tests and, and they aren't quite sure what they're dealing with and, and they tell you that they'll call back in a day or two and a day or two turns into three or four and, and there's some real anxiousness because you're waiting, your health is in the balance and, and whatever course of treatment they're going to need to pursue is is undetermined yet, and so there's that waiting that feels really, really uh, worrisome and, and anxious and uncertain. Now, Advent is, is a season, as we've already said, it's a season of waiting. It's, it's a time that really, um, it's, it's not, you know, the Bible doesn't command us to celebrate Advent, but the church historically has celebrated Advent as a way, it's sort of a discipline, it forces us to slow down. Right in the weeks leading up to Christmas, Advent is, is a way to remind ourselves that, that so often God's people are a waiting people. I mean, Adam and Eve fall into sin and God promises that he would send a Savior, but he doesn't do that you know, three days later. He does it centuries later. And so in the meantime, God has his people wait. And if you follow along in the story of the Old Testament, you see that the waiting was a lot of uncertainty, there was sometimes a, a maybe almost despair, there was feelings that maybe this was never going to happen. Um, so there's a lot of that different emotion woven into that waiting. And we too, we spend the, the weeks leading into Christmas um, focusing on that waiting. Now we're going to be looking at the Psalms this year because the Psalms are like the, the, the worship book of God's people. They were the, the songs that the Israelites would have sung and prayed together as they as they waited. And you'll notice as we go through the Psalms that the Psalms capture many of those different emotions and longings that go along with waiting. And we're going to pay attention to what those experiences were, what the people were waiting for, and, and what that does to us as, as we wait. 
So the question this morning then is, well, what is Psalm 15 waiting for? What is the, what is the expectation and the hope and the, and the longing of Psalm 15? Well, if you have your Bible open, I want you to turn to verse 5 and, and look at the second part of verse 5. In fact, it's the very last sentence in the, in the psalm. And the psalmist, what he does is he lays out a, a sort of a promise. He says this, He who does these things will never be shaken. He who does these things will never be shaken. Now do you hear what the psalmist is promising us there? He's saying there's a way that you and I can have a life that is stable and anchored and grounded even amidst all of the many uncertainties of daily life. Right? Don't you want that? Don't you want a life that is, that is rooted and anchored and grounded? Because there are so many, I mean, life can change so quickly, can't it? Whether it's the loss of a loved one, whether it's not getting into that college that you'd hope to get into, whether it's an illness, whether it's a relationship that falls apart, life can be very shakable. Life can change so quickly. And so the question is then, what, where do we go for, for something that will anchor us? So that even when, you know, you can think of it like a tree, even though the tree might sway, it's still grounded, it's still rooted in something that you can count on and something that you can build your life on and know that it, whatever else may change, it's not going to destroy you. And the thing about it is, this is not an optional, um, this is not an optional thing. We all ground our life in something. We all anchor our life in something. Uh, if, you're, if you're a believer or if you're not a believer, we all look to something for stability, for certainty, something that's going to keep us safe and grounded. And so the question then is, well, what are you looking to? And I think there's a kind of a simple way maybe to answer that. Um, I'll give you two questions, and, and these will just be sort of like diagnostic questions that can help you figure out where do you where do you default to to give your life grounding? The first question is this. Where do you go to heal your hurts? When you're anxious, when you're afraid, when life is in the pits, where, where does your mind and your heart sort of naturally drift so that you can go, well, if I have this, I'll feel better? Now, sometimes it's an addiction, right? Sometimes it's alcohol or drugs or pornography or something like that. But, but other times it's, you know what, it's, it's you look to relationships or you look to family or you look to friends or you look to other, other people and you say, well, I, I've got to count on them and as long as I have them in my life, then my life will be okay. And that sort of leads into the next diagnostic question, which is it's kind of like this. It's like a fill in the blank. As long as I have blank my life is okay. So it's not just where do you go when you're hurting, but it's like where do you set your hopes and your expectations? And what do you, what do you tell yourself? As long as I have, like, maybe it's a job title, maybe it's a degree, maybe it's a relationship, maybe it's money, and you say, as long as I have this, I'll be okay. Now here's the thing. You count on these things, and sometimes they look very stable. But in some way, shape, or form, they'll always let you down. I'll tell you a little story. It's, it's, um, it, it, was, it was from the memoir of an actor that some of you will recognize. The actor's name was Rain Wilson, most famous for playing the character Dwight Schrute on the TV show The Office. And a few years back, he wrote a memoir, and he talked about how through so much of his early life, you know, growing up, um, what he wanted more than anything else was success. He wanted to make it big in the theater world because he felt that if he, if he could make it big, then people would recognize him and admire him and, and he would sort of be, he would have it, he would have it made. And so he, he would fill in that blank by saying, as long as I have my professional success, then I'll be okay. Life will be all right. Well, lo and behold, he makes it big. He lands a spot on Broadway. This was even before he made it into the office. So he's on Broadway. He's in a pretty major role, and he's, he's really excited because he says, this is going to maybe get me a Tony Award, and he had it all laid out in his mind. But then 
he'd wake up, he'd find himself waking up in the middle of the night, and he'd feel desperately alone. And he'd feel desperately unhappy. And then he would feel guilty for being so unhappy because he says, I have everything I've ever wanted. And yet, why do I feel so empty inside? See, he had built his life on success. And then when he got it, he realized that it was not a stable foundation. It was not a life that would not be shaken. So then the question for us is, where do we go for a life that can't be shaken. Well, let's back up. We started at the end, verse 5. He who does these things will never be shaken. So then the question is, well, what things? Well, the good news is that's answered for us starting in verse 2. If you have your Bibles open, you're going to look at verse 2, and it's going to answer this question for us. It gives a whole long list of things, and there are different ways that you could sort of break this down and categorize this. If you go through, it talks about the way that we speak, and it talks about how you treat your neighbor, and it talks about um, having a moral compass where you despise what is evil and honor that which is right, and it talks about keeping your oath, and it talks about economic injustice. And so the question is, okay, how do you, how do you sort of categorize that? And you, I looked at it first, and I thought, well, maybe it's like the do's and don'ts of, of obedient living, like do this and this and this, but don't do that, because the psalmist actually does use that language. Um, and there are other ways, but, but I, wanna, I, wanna, I think it works best to look at this. If you look at verse 2, it says, He whose walk is blameless and does what is righteous. Those are words that are often used in connection with a person's obedience to the moral law, to God's moral law, or what we might call the Ten Commandments. What the psalmist is really saying is, um, if you want a blameless life, it ties into living a life of conformity and obedience to God's law. Now, here's the thing about that. Um, the psalmist goes on and gives a number of examples, and I think the way that you can kind of look at this is through the lens of integrity. What the psalmist is really saying is what you're, what you're after and what you ought to desire is a life that in, in all areas of your life, it conforms to God's law. Right? We call it integrity. I mean, you've all known people, we've all known people who, you know, they show up and, and they're one way at church, right? They, they talk one way, they, they talk really good and they sound very spiritual, but when they go to work the next morning, they're screaming on the phone at clients and they're chewing out their employees and you're saying, what happened there? And what it is, is it's a break of integrity. Or you've known people who maybe around their friends, they're really encouraging and really they compliment and they're really, you know, they use their words in a way to build people up, but when they come home, all they do is they criticize their spouse and they scream at their kids. And, and we look at them and we say, there's something wrong there. And what it is, is it's a break in integrity. You're keeping God's law in one part of life, but not in the other. And what the psalmist is saying is across the board, you're going to be a person that's blameless and righteous. You, you seek to live a life of obedience in every corner of your life. Your life doesn't break down into little pockets of, well, here's how I live at church, and then at home I'm this way, but at work I have to play by these rules, and you kind of change and adapt. The psalm says across the board you're a person of integrity. And then you get into some of the specifics, and, and it's kind of neat the way the psalmist bookends some of these things. I'll show you what I mean if you look in verse, um, the second part of verse 2. The psalmist talks about speaking truth from his heart. And then the second part of verse 4, keeps his oath even when it hurts. Now we all know that sometimes it's fairly easy to tell the truth, right? I mean, there's some times where there's really no cost. Speaking up and saying what is right is, is not so difficult. But then don't you know, and haven't you ever been in that situation where if you speak the truth, you know that it's going to cost you. You know that the people that you work with are going to look at you differently. You know that it might harm your reputation among other people. If you stand up and say, hey, we can't do that, that's not right, it's going to hurt you. You, you know that it might cost you relationships, maybe romantic relationships, maybe friendships, maybe just collegial relationships that you have with other people. You know that speaking your truth or speaking the truth is going to hurt you. It's going to come at a cost. Or you know that keeping your oath, keeping your commitment to other people 
is really, really difficult sometimes, right? Following through, you make a promise, you commit to something, and the psalmist says you keep your oath even when it hurts. And sometimes there are times where we make a commitment. We give our word. And then you realize it's far more costly to keep your word than to break it. And a person of integrity keeps their word, even when it hurts. Look at verse 3. No slander on his tongue and does his neighbor no wrong and no slur on his fellow man. Right? Maybe you've had it before where someone flatters you to your face. They just tell you all kinds of really good things. You feel really good about it afterwards. Then you find out that they went behind your back and they told a bunch of other people things about you that made you look really bad. They found out details about your life and then they just go and spread that around. That's kind of what the psalmist is getting at here. Right? To, to cast... Um, to slander has that connotation of you kind of you spy on another person's life and then you go and you broadcast everything you've learned to everyone who will listen. Right? That's well, that's not integrity. Right? You talk kindly to a person's face and then go behind their backs. Verse five: Who lends his money without usury and does not accept a bribe against the innocent? Now I know there are some people here who might be tempted tomorrow to want to go to your mortgage company and refinance your mortgage and tell the mortgage lender, hey, you can't charge me usury. You can't charge interest on this loan anymore. Wouldn't you love to do that and have biblical support for it? Sorry, it's not going to happen. I'll tell you why. Usury, a lot of times we translate that as interest on a loan, but it's not interest, strictly speaking. It's, it's a little bit different. In Israelite times, um, if you were, well, look, look at it today. If, if today you fall on hard times and let's say you go bankrupt, that's not an easy process, right? That's actually stressful and a lot of worry involved in that. But what you really do is you go down to the courthouse and you file papers and you, you, you pay a fee and then the debt is discharged. And, you know, it's, it's not an easy process. But at no point in that whole process do you ever worry that maybe they're going to come and take your kids away from you. Maybe they're going to take, you know, your family away from you and put you into slavery. You just don't worry about that. I hope you don't. You shouldn't. If you lived in Israel, well, that, that might have been a real concern. That would have been a concern. If you go broke and if you lose your farm and, you know, maybe it's a bad year agriculturally, um, what could happen is you could, your kids and your family could be sold off into slavery. And then so what you would have is you'd have these, they were, they were like loan sharks essentially, where they would come along and they would figure out who's really near bankruptcy and, and then they would float you a loan and that loan was designed to at least give you the illusion that maybe you can avoid bankruptcy, but it was such excessive interest that the person making the loan knew that probably they'll never be able to repay that. And so, but they're desperate, so they'll, they'll commit to that, you know, they'll take that loan anyways. And then the person giving the loan knows that as soon as that person finally does go broke, then I own them. So that's what it was. The idea being you are exploiting vulnerable people for your own gain. It's not just normal interest, it's exploitation of the poor and the weak and the vulnerable in the community. And the psalmist says that's not consistent with a person living in accordance with God's moral law. And perverting justice, accepting a bribe, kind of the same thing. You're letting money corrupt the justice system. Now, here's the thing. The psalmist says do these things and you'll never be shaken. So ask yourself, is this, is this how you live consistently? I, I go through the list and I know that I don't live consistently by what the psalmist says. Not one of us does. Now, what we ought to do is first be honest with ourselves and say, this is how God's people are called to live. This is the kind of people that God wants us to be. He wants us to be people of integrity. It pleases him when we don't go behind people's back and slander them and when we don't exploit the poor. This is what we ought to be striving for. You and I, to be consistent with the people God calls us to be, this gives us a good picture of that. So it's worth examining ourselves. Where, where do we see our own weaknesses here? Where do we see ourselves falling short? But as I said, you start to do that and you also realize second thing you begin to realize very quickly is that no, you don't live up to this. No, you don't. There are times where you behave differently and you act towards people one way and then you change your very character towards another person. Of course, we, we do. We all do. So then the question is, well, how is this, how is this good news? 
how does this give us any kind of hope? Well, we haven't finished with the psalm yet, so we can go back to the psalm and look at verse 1. We sort of worked our way through this backwards. In verse 1, we, at, we read a question. Lord, who may sojourn in your tent? Who may dwell in your sanctuary? Who may live on your holy hill? I put the quote up in front of you um, using the language of the ESV, not because there's anything wrong with the NIV, but the ESV gets us a little more precise, I think, on those two words that I've highlighted in yellow. Because um, what is a sojourner? Sojourner is someone who's kind of been kicked out of their homeland. They've lost their homes, usually because of violence or some kind of natural disaster or conflict or war or something of that sort. So they have to leave their home and they become an exile somewhere. They become a wanderer, right? They're looking for a place that's a little more permanent. And then the person who dwells, what's a person who dwells? That's someone who's found home. It's a person who's actually been welcomed into a place of security and protection and safety and stability. It's a person who's actually now living in, um, in, in something that's free from all the threats that they might have experienced as a sojourner. And what the psalmist is saying is, is how do we find, how do we find a, a dwelling place in your presence, O oh Lord? Right? Because he uses the language there of, um, <clears throat> Of, of tent and holy hill. That's a way of talking about the place where God's presence was. So the psalmist is saying, how can strangers and, and pilgrims and exiles and sojourners, how can we find a place in the, dwell, in the presence of God? How can we find a place to call home in God's presence? And friends, that's, that's the story of the whole of Scripture, if you stop and think about it. In fact, it's your story and it's my story. Because if you go back to the very beginning, you go back to Adam and Eve in the garden, what do you have? You have two people who are living in the presence of God, dwelling in the presence of God, living that life of, of obedience and stability, at least at first, right? And they're enjoying this place in the presence of God, in the dwelling place of God, enjoying the provision and the protection and the care of God in his holy sanctuary, you might say. But the minute that they sin. And God comes looking for them, and what is the consequence that he puts on them? What, is it, what does he say? He says, you have to leave the garden. The minute that that happens, Adam and Eve and all their children become exiles. They become sojourners. They become strangers. They become alienated from their father. They, they lose their home. And from that moment on, humankind has lived as strangers from God as exiles. You and I, by nature, live as strangers and exiles from God, homesick, longing back for the presence of God, and we don't live that life of stability, and we don't live that life of integrity because we're living for self. And so the psalmist's question is, how do we get back to our home? How do we get back? How do we return to this place of, of dwelling in the presence of God? How do we, how do we find our way home? That's the story of the whole of the Old Testament especially, but it's in another way the story of all of humankind. How do you get back to the presence of God? And you know what? Religion essentially says, do these things and you will get there. Be a good person. Be a person who never lies and who never slanders and don't go behind your neighbor's back and don't talk ill of them and don't do things that are morally reprehensible to them. If you be a good person, if you live an unshakable life, then God will accept you. That's, that's, that's essentially what religion says. Religion, all different religions say, do these things, and then you'll make it home. And Christianity and the gospel says no. The whole message of Christmas, the whole message of the incarnation, the whole message that the Israelites were waiting for for hundreds of years was not how can we find a way up to God. But God's answer was to come down to them. God's ultimate answer to the problem of alienation and, and homesickness was for God himself and his son Jesus Christ to leave his home. Jesus leaves his dwelling place with the Father. Why? He comes down into this world as a sojourner. You remember John 1 verse 14. We read this often at Christmas time. What does John 1 verse 14 say? It says that the Word became flesh and what? Tabernacled, dwelled among us. 
The whole message of Christmas is God coming to us. God becoming a sojourner. God losing his, his dwelling place. And if you look through Jesus, if you look through this list, Jesus kept every one of these things perfectly. Right? Jesus was blameless and righteous. He spoke truth from his heart. Never once did he slander another person. Never once did he do his neighbor wrong. Never once did he cast a slur on his fellow man. Never once did he lose his moral compass. And guess what? He kept his oath. He kept his promise and his commitment. God kept his commitment to us even when it hurts. And guess what? It hurt him all the way to a cross. It hurt him all the way to death for Jesus to keep his promise to you and to me. Right? Jesus is that one who lives that life of, a, of perfect integrity, keeps his commitment. And then, in Jesus, <clears throat> as he, in, in, in the end of his life, what happens? He goes up onto that holy hill, that same place that the psalmist was referring to. The psalmist is referring to the hill outside of Jerusalem. The temple hadn't been built yet, but the psalmist is referring to that holy hill where God's dwelling place would be built. Jesus goes up onto that very same hill, not to commune with the Father, not to experience close fellowship with the Father, but to lose it. To lose that, that, that communion with God on the cross because he cries out, my God, why have you forsaken me? So Jesus lives this life of perfect integrity. He lives this life that is perfectly blameless in every way. He, of all people, should have had the unshakable life, and yet he goes up on the cross and he loses everything. Why? To bring us home to bring you and I back into relationship with the Father. The, message, the Christmas story, the gospel message, is not how do you get up to God, but it's God coming to us to bring us home. Guess what? Build your life on anything else, on money or success or fame or relationships, other people, whatever it is, build your life on any of those things and will always be shaken. Jesus is the foundation. Jesus is the one that you must build your life on. He is the unshakable one. Building your life in an unshakable way isn't about trying to be a good person. It's anchoring your life to Jesus. Jesus even says he, he is the rock. Build your life on him and you will never be shaken. Now we're coming this morning to the Lord's table. And the Lord's, it's so appropriate and it's so fitting to celebrate the Lord's Supper during the season of Advent because Advent is, is about looking forward and it's about awaiting and anticipating. And as we come to this table, that's exactly what we do. See, Jesus himself is our host. He is present with us. He welcomes us into his holy presence. Not because we're worthy, not because you've had a really unshakable week, but because in Christ you are forgiven. In Christ you may approach and share this meal. He is our host. He nourishes and feeds us here. But at the same time, it's still a meal of waiting. It's a meal of saying, you know what, one day we're going to sit down at a meal, at a table much bigger than this and eat a meal much bigger and more elaborate than this, we're going to be at our true home. We're going to be in our dwelling place with Jesus and we will eat and share this meal face to face. Build your life on Jesus and it will never be shaken. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you came and you did for us what no matter how hard we tried, for how long we tried, we'd never be able to do it. You, you lived that unshakable life. You lived a life of righteousness and blamelessness in the way that you talk, the way that you spoke of others, the way that you acted towards them. Lord, Psalm 15 paints a perfect picture of how you lived. And, and yet, Lord, you also were treated as the one who lost your home. You, you became a sojourner in our world so that we might find our true home, so that we might dwell in your presence. Lord, what a glorious and, and beautiful gift that is. Help us to see where we are inclined to build our life. Help us to see the places that we are, um, maybe other things that we're tempted to look to for stability, for comfort, for happiness. Um, and instead, Lord, help us to turn to you because you're the only one that's unshakable. So welcome us now and receive us as we come to this meal and as we share it together. We pray it all and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.